Epigenetics. I did an online course learning about it when I was in university and went, wow, this is cool. I then read a book on it. I then met the author of the book a few years later. And a few years later, I'm now doing my PhD project, which has involved, you guessed it, looking at some epigenetic marks. You might say, I'm a fan, which would be true. Which is also why we are back with an update on epigenetic marks. In particular, epigenetic marks that are being characterised to understand ageing. Now, while there are many epigenetic marks, the ones that have been characterised and been shown to have changes that correlate with age are DNA methylation marks. These marks influence what genes are expressed within a cell and have been used to create epigenetic clocks. Clocks that can predict age based on what subset of sites have the presence of DNA methylation. DNA methylation is of interest because it can be binary and it's information rich. You either have methylation or you don't. But there is also still much we don't understand about it. Which is why I was intrigued to read this recent review on DNA methylation and thought it would be worthwhile to speak with Kirsten, a PhD student at the Institute for Health and Sport at Victoria University in Australia, who wrote this review as an extension from her own research project. Kirsten gives a better explanation of the epigenome. So um, if we just break the word apart, um, epi is kind of Greek for on top or above, and genome would of course be our genetic code or our DNA sequence. And so the epigenome is, is um, kind of determines the operations of the cell. So these collection of chemical modifications that sit above the genetic code and they dictate um, the operations of the cells. So they dictate if a cell is a neuron or if a cell is a skin cell. And then they also determine um, the activity of that cell, you know, how it responds to different environmental um, stimulation or stress, for example. Um, and we are interested in a particular epigenetic modification called DNA methylation. And DNA methylation is um, it's essentially just these little tags, little methyl groups that sit at very precise locations in the genome. Um, and if that site has a methyl tag, we would say it's methylated. And if it doesn't have that methyl tag, we would say it's unmethylated. And these are just really attractive to us because they're very easy to quantify. And so some marks change with age, but it is not that they all increase in methylation with age or they all decrease. Some go up, some go down. And then there are some sites that get more variable with age. Kirsten is using new terminology to overcome this. Differentially methylated positions would be our most well-described um, DNA methylation changes that we see with age. Um, so when we're talking about differentially methylated positions and variably methylated positions, I'm just going to say DMPs and BMPs, um, we're talking about individual CPG sites that change with age. So DMPs are CPG sites that change in the average methylation fraction. So a site can gain methylation or it can lose methylation with age, and we measure this average change over time. And why these are interesting is because they, they very closely track chronological age or chronological time. So young individuals of the same age will share a methylation fraction, um, say, for example, a methylation fraction of 20%. And then at older ages, at this same um, DMP, older individuals might have an, a methylation fraction of 80%. So we would say that, that there's obviously an average change from between 20% to 80%. Um, then conversely, VMPs are just a little bit more um, they're less well characterized. So there's one major study that's really looked at them in, in blood. And um, VMPs don't necessarily shift in their mean methylation, although some do, but they don't necessarily shift in their mean methylation, but rather we look at their variability over time. So um, a lot of these sites, we see this increase in, in variance in, in methylation fraction. So young individuals might have the same methylation fraction, but then at older ages, um, people of the same age can have numerous different methylation fractions at this particular CPG site. So we'll see this really this divergence from, from the average. Okay, yeah, because I think that leads on to my next question, which is you mentioned in the review how you considered these, or maybe these DMPs being more reflective of primary mechanisms of aging, whilst VMPs may be more reflective of secondary, like um, more stochastic aging, as you, as you say. So could you maybe elaborate on that a bit more? Yes, absolutely. So um, 
aging has been defined in the past as like these two processes happening. So primary aging being, you know, very related to our maximum lifespan. So we see changes, you know, like the functional, the function of our cells and tissues kind of become impaired with, with chronological aging, with chronological time. You know, we all experience skin aging or we'll lose muscle mass. Um, so that would be, you know, primary aging. Um, and because DMPs very closely uh, track chronological aging and we can, you know, use these sites to predict chronological age, we, you know, these, we hypothesize are underpinning this primary aging process. And then conversely, secondary aging would be, you know, those additional deleterious changes that kind of increase our risk for, for disease and disability. So what I mean by that is we're all exposed to different environmental um, factors over our lifetimes. So, you know, I could smoke, be sedentary, um, and, you know, experience a greater functional decline than somebody else who is of a similar chronological age. And that is what we would refer to as secondary aging. And so because VMPs show this divergence um, from the average, um, you know, this, this stochasticity, as we would say, um, we, we hypothesize that these are underpinning or these are capturing some, some aspects of secondary aging. And why that's exciting is because if that is the case, that would mean that these particular sites are um, amenable to intervention. So these are the sites that we can potentially act upon um, with you know, drugs or lifestyle or whatever the case may be. And so given the data that's been collected, it seems that the epigenome gets more disordered. The entropy increases with age. So entropy is quite an interesting concept because um, when we're talking about um, the methylome, I'm just going to focus specifically on the methylome. If we look at the DMPs, so these average ships of methylation, we see that um, many of these differentially methylated positions shift from um, high methylation or low methylation in young people to like kind of like an intermediate methylation of around 50%. Um, so what this is referred to as kind of like the smoothening of the epigenetic landscape, which is what um, David Sinclair speaks about, you know, like noise that's kind of accumulating because um, these basically entropy is a probability formula that we use to try and um, quantify all these age-related changes in a single measure. So it's, it's almost like a measure of, of uncertainty. So if these sites are shifting to a methylation of around 50%, it becomes very difficult to predict the methylation fraction at the, at that particular site, um, and that is that is an entropic measure. So we would see this increase in entropic decay um, with age, and that's the accumulation of of noise in the epigenome, which is related to David Sinclair's informational theory of, of aging. Okay. Oh, cool. And so we've now spoken a lot about your few, but maybe we can now shift more to like maybe the motivation behind your review and maybe if you could elaborate on your actual PhD project and how that relates to epigenetics. Yes, absolutely. So um, my current project is um, we're taking on the very ambitious task of trying to build this map of aging um, in, in humans, um, sort of a multi-tissue map of, of the aging methylome. And in wow. order for us <laughs> and in order for us to do that we need to we're you know collaborating with research groups all over the world to try and gather as much data as we can um in humans epigenetic data so we're gathering we've got about 186 data sets of um of epigenetic data from 14 human tissues so what we're really trying to do is characterize all these changes um with age and we were really you know fortunate to um to collaborate with um Steve Horvath and Andrew Teschendorf on the review who gave us some really good ideas about about um, how to quantify aging. And so, you know, we're hoping to capitalize on those expertise in the future, but yeah, essentially we wanna build this, this map of aging and then um, publish it as an online tool. And then, you know, with that, you know, it's almost like a, um, a it'll be a resource for, for research, researchers or, or pharmaceutical companies in the future to then potentially assess the effect of, of different lifestyle pharmaceutical interventions on these aging signatures in different tissues. Um, okay. Yeah. And so you, you said offline that you're um, more of a computational biologist. So what exactly is it that you're doing? Are you trying to develop the algorithms or are you processing the data? 
Um, so we're pre-processing everything. Um, wow. Yeah, so my, so my, my research is obviously very um, bioinformatics or computational. Um, one, one tool that we're actually using, so what we're trying to do is, um, so we download and pre-process all this DNA methylation data, and then we run you know, a series of statistical tests to identify these, these sites or these um, aging signatures you know, in every single data set. And then what we need to do is we meta-analyze um, this data. And the reason why we're using a meta-analysis is because in human studies, um, it's very difficult to obtain epigenetic data from tissues other than like blood or saliva, because it's hard to come by, you know, like a, a data set of muscle samples or heart samples. And so sometimes these data sets are too small and lack, um, you know, we don't have su sufficient statistical power to identify these, these aging signatures in tissues other than blood. Um, and so by, by using a meta-analysis, we kind of try to overcome this limitation that we see in human studies. Okay, and so you mentioned that actually getting access to tissues is one sort of limitation at the moment and, and in terms of the progress in the field. But what other questions in the space of like epigenetics and DNA methylation um, do you still feel like are um, unaddressed? Obviously, one question that comes up a lot is that we don't necessarily know if the marks are causal to the aging process or they're just some kind of reflective um, indication yeah. of it. Causal consequence. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, will we ever really know, you know, what's, <laughs> what's the cause? Is it, is it damage? Is it metabolism? Um, we're not quite, we're not quite sure. So that is certainly, um, that is certainly a question. You know, once we've kind of identified these sites, what do they really mean? You know, where are they, where are they occurring in the genome? What is their function? And functional studies are really difficult to do in, um, I think, with with DNA methylation because sometimes sites don't act in isolation, and we're, you know, perhaps not quite sure which sites are are working together to produce a functional consequence. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, that that is an area to address. I think also looking at, you know, cellular heterogeneity is a big thing. So we're looking at whole tissue, but if whether or not these changes are occurring in specific cell types is, is an area of interest. I think there is some work being done in that in that area. And then something else I think is um, we know surprisingly little about the sex specific epigenetic aging. In, in different tissues, you know, so whether males and females um, diverge in their epigenetic patterns um, with age. And I think this is important when we're looking, when we're thinking about lifestyle intervention, you know, do males and females adopt the same strategies? Um, and at what ages, you know, do we do we adopt different strategies? So this is a focus of, of some of the, um, some of the work in our group is looking at this sex specific aging. Which are, that's quite interesting, you know, males and females exhibit very disparate aging rates where females tend to outlive males, sort of every single age, um, but, you know, a greater proportion of their life is spent in morbidity. So there's obviously some robust feature of biology that's at play here, but we're just not quite sure at the epigenetic level, um, what does that look like? Um, yeah, and then of course, you know, um, longevity interventions, um, a lot of our knowledge comes from model organisms. Um, so, you know, we want to see more in humans. So we, our lab is also looking at um, the effect of exercise um, on these aging signatures in muscle. So that, yeah, that's also an area of interest, I think, for future studies. So is there future potential for epigenetic clocks? Truthfully, I, that's, a, that's a difficult question. I don't know if I know the answer. Um, I mean, I suppose, you know, epigenetic the epigenome is, is attractive as a therapeutic target because it is plastic or malleable. Um, so, you know, if we can, I can take a swab and say, you know, biologically, your epigenetic marks are saying that you're five years older than you are, but, you know, and then I can exercise and see those changes over time. Um, well, you know, those, those changes slow. That would be marvelous. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know right now. Um, you know, there are consumer products available that are biological age predictors. Um, I think there's a lot of work that we that we need to do in this space. Um, but yeah. So it seems there is still potential, but it needs more researchers like Kirsten. So what does it take to be a PhD student? I think 
uh, for me, I just have this, um, and I'm sure it's the same for you, just this insatiable appetite for for pursuing knowledge and um, and you know science is something that is so challenging it challenges you on it challenges you on every single level and the learning curve never ends um and it really does keep you humble <laughs> um i also i love discussing ideas i love collaborations um so i love you know working with people that are passionate about what they do and i think i am quite a purpose driven person so I like to think that, you know, the work that we're doing, that, you know, our research group is doing, or the collective field is doing, um, will have a positive impact on, on people in the future. And so that's, if, if that's something that is appealing to you, you know, it's, a, it's not easy, <laughs> but I, it's certainly, I wouldn't, yeah, it's certainly worth it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. So research is very much still on the way in exploring how epigenetics change with age. I think an important takeaway is that besides just looking at what sites increase or decrease in methylation with age, a higher order level approach integrating the changes of multiple sites should be considered. I think a major take home, you know, aging is a driver of most chronic disease, but, and we know this, but what we don't know, we still, you know, the upstream causes of, of aging are still you know, fairly misunderstood or poorly understood. Um, the the changes that we see in in the methylome, you know, epigenetic clocks are a huge focus in the in the in the field at the moment. But there are so many ways that we can quantify aging using DNA methylation data, and I think that's a really really big focus. So we want to we want you know the takeaway to be like maybe we need to look at the methylome in its entirety and not. Um, you know, so kind of quantify these global signatures of aging um, by looking at different features. So looking at um, differential methylation, variable methylation, entropy, and, you know, I haven't even touched on correlation networks, which are also very, very interesting. Um, so there's just, there's a lot that we can do um, by looking at DNA methylation data. I mean, would you like to elaborate on the correlation networks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's... Um, yeah, so correlation networks, um, but essentially, you know, many CPG sites, um, they don't act in isolation. And so we can measure these pairwise, cor pairwise correlations. This is, you know, this is Steve Horvath's work. Um, we can measure these pairwise correlations and we can build modules um, that we can then associate with aging and, and aging phenotypes. I think what we don't know yet, which is, which is, would be really interesting is whether, you know, there are modules that um, are kind of robust in, in young individuals, but then these correlations sort of break apart or become less um, strong. I don't know if that's the right word, but it, you know what I'm trying to say? So we have these, these, these aging modules in young that sort of um, lose correlation. So our DNA methylation sites that lose correlation with age. So I think that would be a really interesting, um, interesting um, the thing to analyze. But work is still being undertaken to make sense of the DNA methylome, but it's cool stuff. And I look forward to checking out Kirsten's research. So with that, I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.